Okay, hello, welcome everyone to our uh, Six to Celebrate Gowanus tour. Uh, as you can see, Brad is actually out in the wilderness. It's a little exciting for us. We are doing a hybrid tour this time where Brad will walk us through a little bit of Gowanus, show us the canal, and then uh, we'll be back to his house and do a screen share presentation. Uh, so also bear with us, the sound might not be totally great when he's on the street and uh, probably be a little bit of weirdness when you connect between the phone and the desktop. Uh, but we are very happy to have all of you with us and to be able to actually show in the outside world instead of just pictures this time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just put them in the, the Q&A or the chat. I'm going to keep monitoring them and uh, we will try to make this as smooth as possible. And um, if you would like any other Gowanus information, Gowanus, as I said, was one of our Six to Celebrate. We have that on our Six to Celebrate website, sixtocelebrate.org. We have a uh, walking tour brochure that you can use to just read or take with you if you can actually get to Gowanus in Peru. Um, it's all, you can download it as a PDF or just read it straight from the website. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Brad, take it away. Okay, thanks so much, Michelle. How's the sound? Sounds good. Okay, wonderful. So my name is Brad Vogel, and as Michelle indicated, I am reporting live from here in Gowanus. Uh, I am standing on the Ninth Street Bridge over the Gowanus Canal. And if you look up, I'm gonna go like this, up above me is actually the Culver Viaduct from the 1930s. And you'll see a little bit more of that here shortly. Um, but I'm also going to spin around here a bit and just show you what we're looking at. This is a view from the bridge going to the south. Now, this is the Gowanus Canal heading down toward the place where between Red Hook and Sunset Park, it empties out into Gowanus Bay and then out further into New York Harbor proper. So we are, we are very much here in Brooklyn looking out at the world. Now, very quickly before we get started here, I'm gonna step out of the way and actually let's just, let's just spin right around here. Now we're looking generally north up the canal and what you're seeing here is a variety of different things. Well, first, just to situate you, if you can see off there past the trees, just barely, there is the top of One World Trade Center. So that is off to the Northwest generally speaking. And here you have a scene along the canal uh, where there is work taking place uh, to help with the cleanup of the canal and the remediation of some of the polluted soil. Um, in the foreground here, you have a newly reconstructed bulkhead that goes along with the Superfund cleanup, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. Off in the distance, you can see some of the tall skyscrapers of downtown Brooklyn. Many of those have only gone up, gone up in the last three to five years. And I think, uh, I believe Joe Spaloff may be on this call. So waving to you, Joe, I believe you're off over in that direction. And over here with the red building and then some of these other buildings, you can see older historic structures that were once used for various industrial purposes and today, are used for variety. Now, if you peek up over the top of those buildings, you can just barely make out the Williamsburg Saving Bank, Savings Bank. And that, that building was for a long time the tallest building in Brooklyn. But a little closer in, you can see the tops of some very tall 12-story buildings that went up along the canal within the past six years. Those are part of the story of development in Gowanus, which is something we are going to get into in much more detail. But for now, I'm gonna take you for an actual virtual street walk along 9th Street back to my house. And as we go, I'll mention a thing or two just to give you a little bit more context. So here we go. So as I mentioned, the culvert viaduct was built in the 1930s to cross over the canal. It could not really go under at the time because of the soil conditions underneath the canal. So the Gowanus Canal 
is what we call it today. Back in the 1600s, when the first peoples, including the Lenape and the Canarsi, were living here, um, it was Gowanus Creek, a creek that wound in from the harbor and was really a series of tidal marshes and salt marshes. So what I'm walking in right now is very low-lying land that back originally when the first European colonists arrived was natural, was a big wide open sort of flat marshy area between a horseshoe of hills. And those hills today, of course, we know are Brownstone Brooklyn, Park Slope, Forum Hill, Carroll Gardens, um, that general ring of Brownstone Brooklyn. Now, you can see again, we're walking along here and there are historic buildings behind me. Brick is really the dominant trend here. And you can tell that this was very much an industrial area and in some ways still is, um, but that has been changing over the last several decades. Off over, on, over my shoulder here, you can see more of the Culver Viaduct. It goes on for a really long time. It slopes all the way down. And interestingly, the building that you're seeing behind me now is something I wanted to point out. So spinning back around here, we are coming up on the Ralston complex, R-O-U-L-S-T-O-N. Now this is a building, as you can see, it's basically built right under the viaduct. The viaduct was built over it because the viaduct, 1930s complex here, 1910 or so. And you can see that this complex with its red brick goes on down to the end of the block. It's basically a block long. Now, this is a building that is not currently designated as a landmark at the city level. Um, you can see it has some Romanesque features and segmented arches, decorative brickwork here and there. And this building is one that the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition sought to landmark in the recent years. But today, to date, it has not yet been designated. Um, it is one, however, that the Landmarks Preservation Commission indicated may rise to the level of a landmark. So the story is not necessarily over. But in the meantime, you can see that there are places where significant change has happened during just that brief window when there was direct advocacy. Now, actually, I should say, HTC has been advocating for this building for a long time um, because it was part of HTC's Six to Celebrate effort with Gowanus. Now, you can see, if you look up here on the corner of the building where the sun is hitting, that is a very recent addition of a stucco-like material that, of course, changes the historic nature. And the windows here, too, and the various openings are also all being modified. So, the, you know, the, the lack of designation is directly impacting this. So, we're heading uphill here, and as you head up the slopes, this is a look down behind me on 2nd Avenue. This is a very industrial area. Now, as we head up the slope from the canal on either side, it becomes increasingly residential. But this is one of the key things about Gowanus. It is a place where residential and industrial exist cheek by jowl. It's very much a live and work neighborhood where people do not have to walk, historically did not have to walk that far. It's also a place where the industry could thrive because of the canal. Historically, the canal was really first started to be made into an industrial waterway in about the 1840s. There had been earlier efforts at trade along the canal, but the 1840s was when it first really starts to become a canal rather than just a natural waterway. And it's by the 1860s, late 1860s, that you really have the full canal that is really a major effort to facilitate development, trade, and commerce. Now, as we're walking up here, you can begin to see a few more residential buildings. And it's really a motley mix 
of different types. You have things from the 1890s, but then I'm gonna swing you around here. And you'll look across night. You also have significantly older buildings. The building in the center there really is dating from some point prior to the 1870s. You can just tell by some of the decorative work, the wood on the exterior, and the shape of the roof. So just for your reference, we are coming up the street towards the site where many believe, and it's not clear that that's going to be answered definitively anytime soon, but many believe that the Maryland 400, the soldiers who helped to win the Battle of Brooklyn in August of 1776, are still buried to this day in a mass grave. Now, let's take a look because, as I said, it's a, a mixed bag here in terms of the architecture and the typologies. You do have structures like this with some rustication and ornament. Um, but right across the street, what do we have? An oil truck garage and a moving company. So there's a lot going on here and a lot of, a lot of sound and, and vitality, even if sometimes it's a little crazy. So we are arriving here at my house. I'm going to flip around and we're going to head on in. So thanks for bearing with me with all that noise along the way. But I wanted to make sure that you had an actual chance <laughs> to take a bit of a street tour in Gowanus, as brief as that may have been. Inside, we'll get a presentation up that has a few more images and we'll be able to go into much greater depth on a lot of those issues. So, walking into the humble abode here in Gowanus. And while the front is stuccoed, I will just show you very briefly, one second here, that there is a big old brick fireplace that runs up through the building and gives a hint as to its age. But let's get to the main event here. And actually, I forgot my hand sanitizer, so just one second. Okay, I think we are now set. One moment. All right, Michelle, did we have any interesting questions along the way? No one has asked anything, but Joe. Not a single hi. question. <laughs> hi, Joe. All, All right. right. And Debbie Copps says hi as well. Excellent. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Joe. Okay, here we are. None the worse for wear. Great to be here. And Michelle, unless you have anything further, I am going to start us out with the program. Someone just asked who inhabited the area first after the Native Americans. Sure. So initially we're talking about Dutch settlers. So this is the sort of the mid 1600s when Dutch settlers are coming to this area and Gowanus is actually a very early settlement as settlements go around what is today New York City. Uh, there are reports already from the 1660s and 1690s of people coming through and really finding a pretty robust little hamlet going here already. People are raising oysters, um, people are harvesting venison and peaches, and they are using tide mills, which is something we will get into once I start sharing the program. Um, but Gowanus is named for a sachem of the Canarsi who from everything that historians have, have told me or that I have read lived in an encampment in what is today basically Greenwood Heights near sort of roughly around the entrance to Greenwood Cemetery and so it was when vessels were coming in that site predominated and sort of gave the name to the entire area of what is Gowanus which is 
essentially the waterway and the valley that's sort of guarded by that point of overlook when you're approaching from the water. Um, there is Joseph Alexiu who wrote the book about Gowanus also notes that it's possible that it's a corruption for the Dutch word for bay. But in any event, that term goes back to a very, very early point in New York history. So the word Gowanus, and it's, there's several variations to it, um, really does go back quite a ways. Okay, let's get into, unless there are any other questions before we jump in, let's get into the program. All right, and also I should make very clear before we get into this, I wear all sorts of hats, including the one I just took off. But today I am on this program just as a pure old resident of Gowanus. So let's take a look at the show. All right. So this is the same water body that you saw earlier um, for all its many problems, looking rather beautiful in this shot and actually was looking pretty beautiful before. Now in both of these shots, we're at relatively high tide. When you get to lower tide with the Gowanus Canal, it can sometimes get a little nasty in terms of how it looks and certainly in terms of how it smells. Now, I put neighborhood on the brink because I feel like Gowanus is a neighborhood where there has been all kinds of change over time. It is a many layered place, but I do think the neighborhood right now is at a point where it may be about to experience a change that is unlike anything that it has faced before in terms of scope and scale. Um, and quite frankly, the ability to ever change the neighborhood again in a significant way if certain things happen. So this is a picture of some of the more recent uses. The Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club has been running programs on the canal for 20 years now. And this was a Brooklyn Book Festival event where there was a reading of Walt Whitman's sea drift poems at dawn with folks looking on when this is where the photo was taken from the Carroll Street Bridge. The Carroll Street Bridge is a designated sea landmark and has been one since the late 1980s. And that bridge is one worth checking out if you happen to be in the neighborhood. So yes, as I said, a concerned Gowanus resident chiming in for you. Now I know some of you have actually been on this tour before in real life or a variation of it. So bear with me, and if you notice any discrepancies or you want me to bring something up that you remember, feel free to chime in. Now, this gets to something that we talked about. I'm going to pull up our little pen here and just give you a sense. Over here, you see something that says Brooklyn Ferry. Now this, roughly speaking, is what is today the Brooklyn Bridge going over to Manhattan. So this is Brooklyn Heights, roughly here. And over here, down in the valley, we have Gowanus. You can see that it is basically one giant swampy tidal marsh. And here is Gowanus Bay, and then you go out to the harbor. This is Red Hook over here, which once was a hook, and a lot of this, a lot of the land that actually makes up Red Hook today was not really land in a lot of ways back in the 1600s. This map is from the 1770s. And I just want to point out how the Gowanus comes in from the harbor, meanders its way around, and has all these tributaries around the area. But notice this, and we'll get to this in a little bit. I'm gonna pull up a different pen color. Notice this, and notice this. And in fact, over here, notice this. These big bodies of water are actually tidal mill ponds. They are the water that is built up by human intervention. In some cases, some of these channels and ponds were actually dug by enslaved peoples, which is important to remember. There was slavery in Brooklyn in the 1600s. Um, but tide mills were some of the very earliest forms of industry and commerce in this area using the natural um, rise and fall of the tide. But let's move right along here to 
a sense of Iguanas. Now, this is a view under the bridge and of the same bridge where I was just standing. But this is from probably about the 1920s or so. Now, just to give you an idea, if this bridge was closed, I would have been standing right about there. And it's about 85 feet up to the subway viaduct. You can see here also that the, the other part of the bridge, the 1990s replacement bridge, that is also part of the scene, is not shown here, of course. Now, this is another part I wanted to mention to you. What is this thing? Does anyone know? If you, want to, if you do know, please type it in the comments. Seeing none, that it, or maybe, maybe comments are disabled for the moment, but this is a, oh, actually, what do we have here? A gas tank, yes. Laura and Joe, thank you. That is a, a gas tank where coal gasification occurred. So it was a manufactured gas that was used to go out as the gas to light gas lamps in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. Now, one of the byproducts, because there were several of these tanks along the canal from quite early on, one of the byproducts is coal tar, which is a car carcinogenic uh, compound. And that is one of the main elements of the, the cocktail of toxic elements that today are in the sediments in the Gowanus Canal and in the, some of the surrounding land. But basically this legacy industrial pollution. Now the other part of the problem with the Gowanus is that it is also basically built as a gigantic open sewer. Because every time it rains, we have joint, we have combined sewers in New York. So when there's too much rain, the, the, what would otherwise be flushed to a sewage plant for treatment basically just runs straight into the canal, untreated, unfiltered. And so the Gowanus for over a hundred years has suffered from this dual problem of human waste and other waste going in via the sewers through the CSO outfalls, combined sewer outfalls or outflows and also the legacy industrial pollution because all kinds of industries set up shop along the banks of the canal. So we're talking about um, plants that manufactured cream of tartar, that were dye works, creosote factories, cement factories, lumber, coal, you name it. If it was something that polluted or could, could be heavy industry in anyone's imagination, it was there but it was also a very active industrial waterway. I wanted to show this element too, that from sort of the 1860s through, really through World War II, 1950s, it was chock full of vessels. It was one of the busiest, especially in the sort of 1920s, it was one of the busiest industrial waterways in the country. So to deal with those problems that have been there forever, the EPA designated the Gowanus Canal a Superfund site in 2010. Now, here we are in 2020 and things are only beginning to really pick up in terms of the actual practical work on the cleanup. This image that you're seeing right now is actually the pilot study that they did in one basin. There are several turning basins that are arms off of the main channel of the canal. This is called the 4th Street Turning Basin. And this is a picture from a few years ago, probably just about, I think about two years ago, where they're doing work in this basin to test out the removal, the dredging. And this is a slow process, as you can see, because it's basically just this one scoop at a time going in and carefully covering all the spaces in the canal um, to remove what's called black mayonnaise. Now, down at the bottom of the canal, there is a big, thick layer of this black mayonnaise sludge, and that's a term that the EPA actually uses um, to describe this very polluted sediment down at the bottom. So the dredging includes actually removing that, and then also the cleanup entails building two gigantic tanks, one at the head of the canal, one at the middle of the canal. So when all this CSO runoff comes down during a storm, it goes into the tanks and stays there, 
until the sewage plants have extra capacity after the rain event, and then it gets pumped out instead of going into the canal. So it's going to be a very long process. I, I don't think until at least 2030, you're going to see most of the cleanup done on the canal. Okay, now why are we doing this? In part, we're doing it so that humans can enjoy a clean canal, but in part we're doing it because of wildlife. The canal, even in its polluted state, has all kinds of wildlife. There are tons of fish, and we know that because we see tons of birds. We see herons, we see egrets, geese, buffalo heads, kingfishers, cormorants, you name it. There are way more birds, way more fish, way more mammals, like the seal that you can see popping up here in the water. Um, and crabs. There are tons of blue crabs. There are mud crabs in the wooden, old wooden bulkheads where they remain. Um, there, is, there are mussels all over in the canal, so there's a lot more life in the canal, even with all this pollution I'm talking about, than I ever expected. I keep finding more examples of it when I go out canoeing on the canal. Just, just for your reference, in case it's not clear, this is the head of the seal in question. Okay, let's orient ourselves a little bit here. And I'm gonna pull up the pen in red. Now, when you greeted me, I was here on the 9th Street Bridge and moved up to about here, where I'm reporting to you from now. The seal that you just saw was here in what's called the 4th Street Turning Basin. That's also where the, the dredging crane was working on its barge here. And I just wanna give you a sense of what we're talking about. So this is Gowanus Bay. You can see how this canal is a more sort of formalized and geometrified iteration of what was once the old Gowanus Creek. Um, and I would say functionally, no one really talks about this too much, but functionally there are sort of two parts to Gowanus. There's, I would say, upper Gowanus, which is roughly this, and then there's lower Gowanus, which is this. And this lower part is the much more heavily industrial, this section. This is still the IBZ down here. So the industrial business zone. And, but as I said, there's also lots of little bits of residential that kind of fade off or trail into the neighborhood and head down the hill towards the canal. And up here, you have big sites along the canal that are in many places empty, but there are two very big buildings right here that I had mentioned earlier. And there's also a proposal put forward to rezone Gowanus to increase the FAR that's possible and to allow development. Uh, we'll get into that further as we go, but I wanted to make sure you had a sense of where we're at on the map. Now, stepping back into a few of those points, I wanted to make sure that we were clear, and we've touched on a lot of this already. There were, it's very important to note, indigenous people living here before the colonists arrived. Then you have the Dutch come, and you can see here, this is actually a map of some of these tide mills. And so you have Denton's Mill, which also became known as Yellow uh, Mill and Brower's Mill. And you had Cole's Mill Pond, which was around here, which today is almost entirely filled in. And you had several different mills in, um, in Red Hook. Now these mills, you can see there's some indications of what they were. A gin works, a ginger mill, that was to mill ginger to make a drink called Jake. Um, flour mills, it was mostly for grain, but there were definitely some other um, uses for these tide mills as well. And they could run about six hours with the tide going in and then another six hours of the tide went out. But they were totally based on the rise and fall of the tide. Um, as I mentioned also, just to be clear, there were enslaved people uh, in Brooklyn and in Gowanus at this time, and they were def I believe it's Coles Mill where there is a record of enslaved people actually helping to dig the pond or the channels that were related to a tide mill. Uh, so again, 
there are almost no remaining artifacts on the surface in the neighborhood that tell that story. Of course, we have to mention, as I mentioned earlier on the walk, the Battle of Long Island or the Battle of Brooklyn, August of 1776. And you can see, let's go with lovely cyan here. You can see the Vec de Cortlou house, 1699, that's over here, the Old Stone House. Now, the Old Stone House that you know today is not the same house. It is using some of the same stones, but it was actually recreated from the ruins um, and moved slightly during the Moses era and the WPA. Um, but what you see here is the pivotal battle where the Maryland 400 and some other soldiers from Delaware repeatedly charged an entrenched British position in the house, a heavily fortified position. And that sacrifice bought just enough time for the rest of the Americans to retreat across the Gowanus and many died as they were doing so. But enough of them got across and rejoined Washington's forces up on the hills here so that they could escape under cover of darkness and fog and live to fight another day. So it was a very large battle and a very early battle. Um, but the, the key point in it all was that the Americans were not defeated here in August of 1776, but went on for years, even as a ragtag force, they just kept existing. And that was really what mattered in the end. But anyway, another layer of history in this strange place between the hills in Brooklyn. Now, Gowanus, 2006 was deemed national and state register eligible. In 2014, there was a strong push in the neighborhood to actually make it a national and state district. That effort did not succeed in part because forces in the neighborhood really strongly misread what national and state register eligibility or district even means. They seem to try to convince the community that that status meant they're going to mandate that you use a certain paint color and not allow you to change your buildings, which as many of you on this call know, that is not the case with the national register or the state register. That is something that one might have to deal with in certain situations with city level landmarking. And that is not what was the case. So a really unfortunate moment because it was a period of great misinformation. Um, and as of 2020, there has been some talk in the neighborhood of pushing for that again, but it has not to this point had enough traction to go anywhere. Now, I wanted to make clear, as I had mentioned on the walk, that 2011, so this is a year after the Gowanus is designated a Superfund site, HDC steps in and nominates Gowanus as a six to celebrate neighborhood. And they were working with the local group FROG, the Friends and Residents of Greater Gowanus. Um, and here is a picture from that time of the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Powerhouse, which we'll get into in a little bit. But this building was known as the Bat Cave um, for some of the arts and sort of rave experiences that happened there in the 1990s and aughts. Um, but I wanted to point this out because HDC has basically been involved for a decade in trying to help this neighborhood and its historic resources. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, there is a proposal that is very much in the works um, looking at a potential city-led rezoning. Now, this is not just one business or one property owner looking to spot zone or to rezone a complex. This is a rezoning of the whole neighborhood. But let's pull out, let's see here, our yellow pen. You can see that the bulk of it is really in what I said earlier was sort of upper Gowanus. The lower portion here that's more industrial doesn't get touched quite as much. Now the canal, just for your reference, and I'll use green. The canal itself goes up like this and up through here and ends right here. So just to give you a sense of where things are at. Now you can see in the purple that some manufacturing is retained and some of the blue, um, 
but really the blue and a lot of the rest of the colors are either a mix or in some cases very large scale residential. So they're looking to bring in 22 story towers along this portion of the canal here and one that's even 30 stories high down here. So it would be a radical change from what the neighborhood looks like today. Um, it would also it includes this whole very long stretch of Fourth Avenue at the boundary with Park Slope. This is really something that's already been rezoned, but it would it would allow for greater height and it would mandate mandatory inclusionary housing in that portion. But just wanted to make sure you were aware that the neighborhood is on the brink in the sense that there is this very significant change um, potentially about to happen. And they could, they could certify the, um, the rezoning any day as soon as land use matters resume with um, DCP. Okay, and this is a picture of what we're talking about. Um, so you can see that this would be a significantly different look to the neighborhood and feel potentially just in terms of the massing and the heights that we're talking about um, compared to that earlier, some of those earlier shots. All right, now I wanted to talk about the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition because in the early days it was HDC supporting Friends and Residents of Greater Gowanus and CORD, which is a Carroll Gardens-based development group, um, and a few others in the neighborhood. Um, but in, in the process of planning for the Gowanus rezoning, the community was you know, brought in at various public meetings. And during some of these meetings, HDC and a variety of other folks felt like concerns about historic resources really just weren't being addressed in a substantive way. And so a group of us banded together and created the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition. Now, the Gowanus Landmarking Coalition was really most active from, I would say, about fall of August, maybe August of 2017, up through last fall, working to try to get buildings in the neighborhood designated. And this is a picture from one of the press conferences along the canal at the Union Street Bridge. And here's a picture down on the bottom uh, at the SW Bound Grain Storehouse. And that's council member Carlos Menchaca in the middle. Um, this building had been damaged by fire and then uh, proceeded to suffer from illegal demolition um, and is now almost entirely gone. But I'll get into that story a little bit later. Okay, so that group working with council member Brad Lander and several other public officials and different groups ultimately managed to persuade LPC to designate these five buildings or complexes um, in fall of 2019. Now, as many of you may know, when there's a city-led rezoning, there's often a handful a sort of token, if you will, set of buildings that gets designated. And we pushed for far more than this. But one thing that did happen that was different here than with the other rezoning sets was in those cases, often the buildings that got landmarked as individual landmarks by the city in association with the zoning were done after rezoning was certified. We very pointedly asked for these to be designated prior to the rezoning being certified, which has happened. Um, so we, you can see again that there is a rough theme here. We did not push for a district only because the historic fabric in Gowanus has certainly a lot of different pockmarks to it. And it, we, we thought that that would be too much of an uphill battle to try to actually get. So we went with this approach and I'll get into a little bit more about each of them. So just to give you a sense of those buildings, one of them is right here, which, oh, actually let me get you a different color. That's not really showing up very much. Okay, let's use a nice vivid green here. This is where the first one, the Flushing Tunnel is located. Another one, the ASPCA is right across the way here. And then we have the Bat Cave right here. 
along the canal. And then we have the American Can Factory right here. And a real sleeper surprise, the Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company or Norgi Sailmakers down here in the IBZ. So just wanted to give you a sense of, and this isn't even in the proposed rezoning area, but just wanted to give you a bit of a sense of how these were sprinkled through the neighborhood. Now, what are the existing landmarks that they joined? One is right here, the Carroll Street Bridge, which is a really cool bridge from the 1880s that's still in service. And it's a retractile bridge, so it moves back on rails at a diagonal, which is very unusual. Um, there's also the Coignet Stone Building right here, which is largely enveloped by the Whole Foods that's around it. Um, and then that, and that was really it for inside of Gowanus proper. So that's just to orient you. Now, this is the first one I was talking about, the Flushing Tunnel Pump House. This is from the 19 teens, and you can see that there's a Romanesque theme, but also some secessionist details. You have that, like a little sprinkling of Art Nouveau type detailing and form in places. Uh, this building has been described as many different types of architectural style um, and everything that I have seen, but it really is in remarkably good shape. And this building's function is really important because let me just hop back here for one moment and pull out our blue pen. So again, that building is right here. Now, why is it called the Flushing Tunnel Pump House? Because there is a gigantic tunnel that runs off this way all the way under Cobble Hill to the harbor at the Buttermilk Channel. And that tunnel allows for water to be pumped in from the harbor and it flushes it into the canal at the head of the canal and it helps to induce a flow in the canal and a current and that aids the tides that come in and out in actually cleaning the Gowanus somewhat. And that tunnel was put in place in 1911. It, the flushing mechanism broke in the 1960s and it didn't, it didn't work for many, many decades until 1999 when it was reactivated and it was especially during that period of no flushing going on that it became known very prominently as the Lavender Lake because there, was, there were dyes, there were all kinds of chemicals. Even today, you'll see sort of rainbow sheen of this coal tar that bubbles up from the sediments, all that gave this very notorious uh, moniker for the canal. All right, let's move right along here. This is the ASPCA building, so the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Now, this building is kind of remarkable, again, with this great little series of Romanesque archways up here in sort of a unique cornice, set of cornice supports with the little green tile diamonds as well. And there's just, there's just a, a wealth of detail on the facade of this building. And you also even have this really cool horse trough that's still out here, granite horse trough, because this building was here predominantly in the early days because all the stables and liveries were down in the Gowanus to service all of the brownstone Brooklyn up on the hills. And this was started as a way to try to prevent mistreatment to a lot of those carriage horses. They even had a motorized ambulance in the building and there's a dog run up on the roof and all kinds of interesting elements here but what a lot of people don't know is that it was only really one one sort of quarter of this building that started out in about 1913 as the building and then in the 1920s these other three quarters were added on as a sort of mirroring of that of an expansion of that original part and this was actually done by the Renwick firm um, of general Renwick fame, for those of you who know architecture around the city. Um, I also wanted to mention this. Take a look at this building, because we'll be talking about that in a little bit. It's really from only about a year after this initial chunk of the building was built, but look how dramatically the architecture has changed and the materials. So we'll get to that in a little bit. 
this is the, as I said, the, the bat cave as we know it. This was a powerhouse and it actually had a much taller, and I'm gonna pull up blue for this, but back off behind it, there was another building that went sort of roughly like this and down, and that was the turbine hall. Um, that was, so it was really two components and all we're seeing today is one part of it. Again, with these heavy red brick Romanesque arches and the brick coins and all kinds of detailing that has managed to survive. It has a very heavy Gothic or a Gotham look to it rather. Um, something that you, you feel like you're going to see in the background in a, in a Batman movie, um, hence the Batcave. Um, and it was this upper floor here that was open and vacant that was full of graffiti. And I had a chance to see inside as it's being rehabbed. It's being made into an art factory by Powerhouse Arts. Um, but this building was built around 1902 and it provided power for Brooklyn Rapid Transit, AKA the trolleys. So uh, the very trolleys that the the Brooklynites Dodge, giving rise to the name the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, it, this was the place where coal would come in via barges on the canal, go up the little first street turning basin, go into this building and run all of the power generation that, that made it all possible. Okay. Now this is the American Can Factory, or also the Summers Tinware Factory. And this dates from the 1880s, and you can see that there is a significant amount of really great brick detailing. You have these diamonds here, you have these very elaborate cornice encrustations, you have the circular windows here, you have all these little sort of corbels over the windows. It's, it's really just a fascinating building in terms of being a manufacturing building. So this, you you're seeing this side here, there's another building or another facade over here. And then there's another portion next to it that's from the 1890s. It was added as part of the complex. That part was not landmark. It's only this original portion. But it too backed up onto an arm of the canal. And so materials would be brought in and out via the, that part of the canal. That part of the canal, like several others, has actually been filled in over time. And the EPA uh, is going to excavate some portions of those excavated canals during the cleanup. Okay, now this one is the sleeper that I mentioned. This is the one that we were quite surprised that LPC designated, but I'm very pleased about it because it is a really fascinatingly intact building in the American round arch style. And you can see that it retains, so this is the Montauk Paint Manufacturing Company. It later in the early 20th century was Norgi Sailmakers. And so they actually had a sort of sail loft set up. But there's some details here. Look, this is still one of the little pulley-based crane setups for hauling things up and down. You have these little exits for the stairwells up onto the roof that are still intact. You have really interesting, elaborate, multi-layered sort of terraced brick designs here. And of course, this nice bullseye window, but I mean, look at every every level. It's it's weirdly subtle, and again, an interesting amount of detailing to put into a manufacturing building. But this dates from about 1908, and you can see off in the background that we have the trestle from the Culver Viaduct off in the background where I was standing when we started this all out. So. We were not expecting that one, but it was a very welcome addition to the landmarks designated in the city of New York. Now, that's what got designated in the fall. As I said, our list was a bit longer, and this is the building I mentioned earlier. Sorry, the photo's a bit blurry, but this was the 1886 SW Bound Grain Storehouse. 
So today we have all kinds of infrastructure and facilities dedicated to gas and oil, the thing that makes our transit system in many ways run. But in the 1880s and really up until sort of the 1920s, of course, this was a grain storehouse because that was the fuel that fueled horses. And horses, of course, helped to run everything, especially in this very industrial part of Brooklyn. And so you can see again this little gantry here, and you can see the windows. There were, sorry again, it's so blurry, but there were little star tie rods. And you also have this very interesting, what's called a monitor up above, this sort of ventilation and movement um, canopy at the top of the building, which according to the Society for, the, for Industrial Archaeology was a very unique and rare form for any of these waterfront warehouses in Brooklyn. So you could imagine that someone with a creative approach would say, oh, why don't we do what was done with some of the warehouses in Dumbo? Oh, or maybe some of the, the brick warehouses in Red Hook. Nope, this was, let's let it deteriorate and then let's start demolishing it. And then mysteriously, the day after preservationists talk with the city council staff person about landmarking, the building goes up in flames. Very interesting. You can see the shot down here. This is the interior with very heavy wooden beams. And this was just a year or two before the building burnt. It didn't actually burn all the way down. It only burnt a, like a big chunk of this part of the building. Uh, but ultimately, the FDNY did investigate that fire. They found that it was intentionally set, so it was arson. Uh, they found that there was a wooden structure built up in, inside the building uh, that had been built to funnel the flames and, and grow the fire. And they also found in the fire hydrants closest to this site, um, nails and other things that were meant to impede the flow or the ability to use those hydrants. So a really, truly sad, sad thing that happened here. Um, and you know, enraging. Um, arsonists should never win. After the, after the fire, there were still all kinds of efforts by preservationists to keep it, keep the rest of it from being demolished. Um, and even though you're technically not supposed to get a demolition permit when there's an active um, fire investigation underway, they got the permit anyway. And they continued and the building is functionally gone. There's like one corner of one wall left and that is about it. But let's look, let's look at some of the other things that didn't get landmarked. But in these instances, LPC indicated that they might actually rise to the level of landmark. One is the Pacific Branch Library. Now this is not really in Gowanus, but this is a really interesting sort of Beaux-Arts Art Nouveau structure that has gone through all kinds of preservation issues over time. It's, it's a wonder that it's still here. Um, but this is actually in the proposed Gowanus rezoning area because it's up on 4th Avenue. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of subset of people who is particularly concerned about this building. Um, so that is one of them. Another is the building I pointed out earlier, the RG Dunn building. Now this was a printing building. And this building dates back to 1914. And you can see that this is this, is this uh, sort of concrete coming into play here in the way that you see with a lot of the World War I era um, waterfront buildings. Um, and you see that in places like Dumbo and the Navy Yard and some of the South Brooklyn waterfront um, structures. But Ultimately, that one has not been landmarked. And then the one I was walking along at the outside of the show, the Ralston Complex down under the bridge. Oh, here's another little gem. This one doesn't necessarily in, in LPC's mind rise to level of landmark, but one that I think is fascinating because it shows you another moment in the history of Gowanus where instead of this being the place for stables and liveries and horses, where you need the ASPCA, 
in the 1920s, it starts to shift to cars. And you can see these really interesting inset little reliefs here of a tire, sort of winged mercury iteration of a tire for a car. Um, and this is the Eureka Garage. Now this weird structure here was added later in roughly the 1950s um, for a woodworking component of this building. But that's another thing with Gowanus is many of the buildings change over time. Imagine that, industrial and manufacturing buildings changing their appearance over time and adapting to the different um, businesses that use them. This is another thing that's really important for looking at how New York City does landmarking because oftentimes it's looking to landmark things that have been trapped in amber and preserved perfectly from their time of construction. And sometimes, if you ask me, the value is actually in the accretion, in the accumulation of change over time that tells the many different parts of the story of a building like this. All right, also the National Packing Box Factory. Now this may not look like it's that special of a building, but again, not only is it very quintessentially Gowanus, um, it is also part of the ongoing story because in the 1990s, for example, actually really the 70s onward, artists begin to move to Gowanus as has happened in many cities in many neighborhoods that are industrial over time. And so this building today is all artists' lofts and studios, and that too is part of the Gowanus story. So that also has not been landmarked. And Michelle, if you happen to see any questions in the Q&A that are crucial to jump in on, just let me know, happy to, happy to help. Now I wanted to go on to another building that's been sort of its own preservation battle in the neighborhood and that is Gowanus Station. Now this is a building in the Beaux-Arts style from the 19, about 1913, 1914. And you can see down here this fantastic pediment with some terracotta elements and elaborate brickwork and bluestone sills and scroll work. And this is really a great exponent of a moment in time where the city has consolidated in 1898 and this is the city of New York coming by in a few, you know, 15 years later and just making clear to Brooklyn that, you know, this is New York City and we're going to stamp this very clearly um, as a symbol of this new unified city. Um, it also very much embraces this idea of the city beautiful movement where even this modest building, which was designed as part of basically a pipe yard with stables where pipes were brought centrally and then moved via horsepower out to different sites to do sewer and road work, uh, basically to set up the very, the very combined sewer system that would continue to plague Gowanus to this day. Um, that was, it's all tied in through this building. So this building though is on the site where the um, city of New York wants to build one of these giant tanks for CSOs, ironically enough. Um, and they want to um, demolish it. Uh, we held vigils there. Um, we've done all kinds of advocacy. This is another sense of the building from the side. Um, basically, at this point, the EPA has signed an agreement that mandates that the city, this is, this is not the ideal, this is not what I want, but this is what we got to was the whole thing comes down and just give me one second here just this facade here on Nevins and all of or it sort of depends maybe some of this facade on Butler would get reconstructed in place now of course as any preservationist will tell you that is way less than ideal because you never know if that will ever actually happen. The pieces might get stolen in the meantime. Um, you might have Beverly Moss spat saying, where did my building go? Who stole my building? Um, or some iteration of that concern. And also, of course, the craftsmanship that went into this 
may not be replicated. So the building is still standing and it's hard to say what will happen, but the city has acquired it and kicked out the tenants. And, you know, I guess all I can say is hope springs eternal and who knows in preservation, it's never over till it's truly over. And then it's still oftentimes not over <laughs> again, as many of you know. Now, I also wanted to give you just a little sense of sort of the general fabric. These are things that not many people have really talked about, but just look at this stretch. This is to some people not an impressive stretch of streetscape whatsoever, but to me, it's part of what I love about Gowanus. These are functional buildings that have been almost entirely unaltered. In case, in a few cases, there's some interesting little changes to sort of blue and black granite sills instead of bluestone. Um, but functional residential and commercial buildings and streetscapes that as soon as, a re in my opinion, as soon as a rezoning gets passed, places like this are going to get swept. Even if they say, oh, we're just going to put a zoning requirement that buildings can go only go up another floor or two beyond this, they will. They will get replaced and rebuilt. Um, and so I personally, with the rezoning, fear the Williamsburgification of Gowanus in its entirety. I think it can stand some incursions and some change, certainly, but I'm, I'm concerned about the scope and scale and intensity of the changes that would come and whether there will be any sense of Gowanus left. Um, not to mention some of the other considerations such as should we be developing in a flood zone on a large scale? Um, how can we ensure that there won't be even more CSO runoff into the canal? Um, is the financing, are the financing presumptions that were in place before COVID still valid today in terms of the real estate um, calculus involved in this rezoning. So lots of questions uh, that remain. Now, as I said, Fourth Avenue is this really long stretch that's included in the proposed rezoning. And yes, that was rezoned and upzoned a long time ago. And what's happening in this rezoning is tweaking that. But you can continue to see these very tall buildings get built. And there's, you know, I advocated directly to Department of City Planning, what about some of these gems along Fourth Avenue and the prospect of retaining at least some of them in some stretches of historic fabric so that this does not become an, un, you know, sort of unmitigated canyon of glass and steel. Um, so I just wanted to point out that there are some really fantastic, again, deeply functional, but also heavily ornamented and really human buildings uh, that are here. And I think they deserve closer attention. So what comes next? There are so many things that I haven't even been able to tell you about Gowanus. There are so many more facets to it. There are restaurants like Monty's, the Italian restaurant. There are people like Uta Zimmerman, who ran the Guana Souvenir Shop. There are artists. There are interesting people like Owen Foote, who's shown here with the Guana Dredgers out leading a tour on the canal. Um, there are weird things like extremophile organisms that live in the bottom of the canal in the black mayonnaise and process it. There are so many things that I can't tell you, but all of that comes together to make a very unique interesting, idiosyncratic neighborhood that I think needs to persist in some way. And so I do think that the proposed rezoning right now is one of the chief concerns that I think stands to radically change um, a lot of those good things about the neighborhood, the things that give it its unique character and its very strong sense of place. So personally, I think that's very much up in the air right now, given that we're in a new paradigm. So things that you can do to help if you are interested, um, and again, this is just my personal take here as, a, as an individual and as a preservationist coming to chat with you tonight. Um, there's a change.org petition, and that is calling for a moratorium on the rezoning. 
There's also an email to city council members where you can go to one URL and create, a, there's a mechanism to create that email that would go out to all city council members to ask them to stop this rezoning. Um, and you could write an op-ed if you feel strongly about it, especially because this is about more than just through Gowanus, it's about any citywide, city-led rezonings um, because it's a, it's a broader issue. Um, and with that, I am going to turn things back to Michelle and I'm more than happy to chat with you and talk any questions. Okay, let's see, I see we have two questions. Uh, All right. Rich wants to know, what is the status of the flushing tunnel? I recall it broke again. Yes, so it, it broke again and actually recently it was upgraded as well to basically some kind of jet based um, flushing mechanism. Rather, it used to originally be this giant old bronze ship propeller. Um, that was the original 1911 mechanism and originally actually it took water from the head of the canal and pumped it out to the channel, out to the harbor. Today, the water comes in the other way, under Cobble Hill, through the pipe, through the tunnel, and then into the top of the canal. Um, they also shut it down in sort of the late part of 2019 to try to reduce how much foaming was going on because it was actually kicking up all kinds of foam and potentially stirring up a lot of the polluted sediment. So that, that led to a shutdown for a while and it was rather remarkable to see the contrast between what the canal is like when the flushing tunnel is working and what it's like when it's not. Um, it was not a pretty picture for those several months. All right. And then Debbie, the diversity of Gowanus is wonderful. I agree. <laughs> um, and I hope too that the character will remain after the, re after the rezoning. You know, I think one thing to remember also is that there's definitely a way that people could come up with, I think, a better solution um, in the rezoning. And I think that's something that's just much more centered on and starting from the community itself. Uh, there was a lot of process, but I don't know that a lot of what people said was actually reflected in the final plan, so. All right, any other questions? We had one person asking about a transcript. Um, so for anyone who's unaware, we, I have been recording all of this, so it will be posted up on the HGC YouTube channel and uh, on our website. Brad, do you have a transcript of this? Is that a possibility? I do not, unfortunately. This is <laughs> this is all mostly just from general knowledge from being here in Gowanus, alas. But if there are any specific questions or specific questions about parts of tonight's program, feel free to reach out. I'm at brad.vogel at gmail.com. So that's B-R-A-D dot V-O-G-E-L at gmail.com. Thank you very much, LTTA, LTG. Uh, that's very nice thing. It's, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Okay. We appreciate that. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining tonight. And again, I hope you learned something. I hope you found out uh, about a, a new neighborhood or more about one that you already know about. And thanks to Michelle and HDC for putting this on. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and um, if anyone is interested, we will continue to have virtual uh, programming. You can check out our website, hdc.org. Uh, our grassroots awards have been split up into sort of various events this year since we obviously can't do one made event. So we are doing a uh, LGBT walking tour with Andrew Scott Dolcart, and then um, we are splitting up a few of the awardees into their own separate presentation um, events. So again, uh, emails will be going out and everything is on our website. And thank you very much, Brad, this was great.
You are most welcome. <laughs> and hopefully we'll all be able to walk along the canal or get out in a canoe very soon. Yes. I, I do miss it. Yes. All, all right. right. Have a good night. Thanks, Michelle. Take care. You too.